So Paul and Keith and I are together to discuss the reincarnation of the mathematical course that's been online. It's, it's, it's not a, a 1.2. It's actually the introduction to mathematical thinking new and improved. Yeah, I would call it version 0 0.2. Okay. 0 0.1 was last September. This is 0 0.2. And we might meet. We might, we might reach a beta release version in a couple of years' time. But of course, we are releasing it. So, is this a matter of your deciding to change content, or is this the changes are more a response to learning about MOOCs as you go along? Uh, partly learning about MOOCs. It's the same content in in some sense. Uh, it's partly learning about MOOCs, and it's partly the feedback we got from the students the first time round. That, have, that we got a lot of ideas for what we thought, what we think might be improvements. We won't really know whether they're improvements till we run them out and test them. Uh, Paul, what do you see as the big difference here between teaching the same content to a flesh and blood classroom with students <laughs> in front of you? Um, there's a lot of differences. Um, I think one of the biggest differences in a MOOC is is the the, uh, the need to plan ahead. That in a normal classroom, you have a lot of opportunity to kind of change what you're doing dynamically in the moment. Whereas in a MOOC, you kind of have to have everything set and ready to go before the course even begins. Um, and that's where the second version, we can make all of these changes that we, you know, kind of thought up as we were going the first time. And it's like, oh, well, we can't put that in right now because the course is already running. Um, but now we have a chance to put some of those things in. So can you, can you give me an example of one of the key changes you've made, Keith? One change, and this is the most obvious one to the students, is last fall it was a seven-week course. This week I've taken the same material and spread it over ten weeks because I got a lot of feedback from students who were clearly motivated, dedicated, were doing fine, but they had lives to live. They weren't full-time students, and they would say, look, I got to week five, and I had to go on a business trip, and there were two lectures in week five. If there'd been one lecture in week five, I could have caught up at the end of the week, but there were two lectures, I had to drop out. And so what I'm doing is I'm giving the first two weeks, there were two lectures a week because it's very introductory. From week three onwards, there's only one lecture a week. So someone who has to miss a couple of days because they've got some commitment will have time to catch up. And that was borne out by the, the, some of the survey data we collected. The median age in the last course was in people in their mid-30s. So it's not just you know, high schoolers or early college students who want to explore this area. It's, we have a lot of students who are, you know, who are professionals who want to come back and look at this kind of stuff that maybe they you know, had to drop when they were in college or they never got a chance to explore. So it's a very different kind of population than a traditional college. Although, you know, it's almost counterintuitive that it would take more weeks to do it because you figure if it's an online course and you have, you don't have to be there at 3 p.m. on mm -hmm. Thursday, you have all day Thursday to go check in there, you'd almost think it would go faster. Um, the freedom in the scheduling. Not with this kind of a course because the, you know, and I kept telling my students this, I kept putting it out on my blogs and so forth, that the bit that they see on the video, the bit that's actually online, that just sets the stage because learning mathematics at this level involves a lot of thinking on your own and a lot of talking with other people and struggling to master material. So you could maybe watch a 30 minute video that I give. It may take you two or three hours of intense thinking off and on to make sense of that thing. So I, in fact, I describe my role as really the conductor of an orchestra. You know, I, I decide which tune they're gonna play, I raise the baton and I leave them to work and I go on and have a cup of coffee somewhere and then come back <laughs> later and see how they're doing and checking in because it's really for them to learn. I'm not really teaching, I'm just setting the stage so they can learn. So there's a lot of time they need to make sense of what I managed to get through in, in 30 minutes on video. And it gives a little more flexibility having the course be over 10 weeks. Even for people who could do it faster, they can mm -hmm. still kind of, I mean, they can still work fairly quickly in that mm -hmm. 10 weeks. And then, I mean, Keith, one of the things Keith says throughout the videos is you have to do this slowly, you have to take your time, you have to think about it. So even people who are getting it and who are going yeah. quickly um, can still benefit from having that extra time, I think. So having had your, your, your base in, in physical, you know, right there education, yeah. what's been your biggest shock? What's been your biggest lesson? Um, oh, wow. There, there were lots of little shocks, I think. Um, the thing that comes to mind is actually not a shock because I expected it was going to happen, but I was sort of surprised when it really did. You know, I love teaching one-on-one -on -one with a student. I love teaching students in groups of maybe five to ten. Mm -hmm. Bring it up to 20. I've never, I always try to cap my classes at 20 when I give physical classes. I've taught classes of 250 and 300. That's the worst possible because there's no contact. It's just an audience. They're basically just wallpaper around the room and they're all on Facebook at the same time anyway. So <laughs> there's no contact. You would think 65,000 students, even worse. It's not 65,000 students. It's 65,000 individual students. Teaching on a MOOC is one-on-one. -on -one. You have a student sitting next to you. In fact, if someone watches my course, you occasionally see my face, but that's just to make human contact. Mostly mm -hmm. what you see is that hand 
and a piece of paper. The way I record them is an overhead camera at my desk at home, piece of paper, talking to a student that in my mind is sitting next to me and in conversational terms going through some mathematics. Now the student can't answer back in real time which is a big problem. Yes. And we can come to that. And people like Paul are going to try and help me to compensate for that. But it's basically sitting next to the professor and talking to the professor and trying to understand what's going on. In other words, in a MOOC, you're teaching one student. Well, Paul, when you talk about the logistics of that, I mean, mm. when you have a teacher who's actually online on that time, changing things or just putting it up, isn't there a natural advantage for the student who's likewise online at exactly the same time and doesn't have that delayed reaction of 10 hours later coming along and, and seeing basically a canned lesson instead of a live lesson? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that there's, um, from the video perspective, since the videos are all kind of pre-recorded, I don't know if there's too much of a difference. Certainly, um, it, within the forums, there are times where like Keith or I will be logged into the forums right. and if somebody posts a question right then that one of us can address there could be some advantage there but actually I think our experience was in the first course um, we actually I think t intentionally tried to stay out of the forum mm -hmm. like answering questions right away until there had been a fair amount of discussion or if it felt like it had gotten to a point that it was an unproductive disagreement um, but there's actually so much value in, in staying out of yeah. the way and letting the students discuss with each other in the forums and our experience was I mean you post, people post in the forums and there's going to be a response within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, almost every time. I'm expecting two kinds of people to come. I know there were a lot of people who took the last course and had to bail and some who took the last course and finished but didn't do as well as they thought, who've already emailed me and said uh, that they're definitely coming back and they'd, they'd like to try it again. So I'm expecting those to come back and, and they will see some changes. Uh, there have been some changes. They would be unwise to be seduced by the fact that things look remarkably the same in the first couple of weeks because they do change as we move on. There's a difference in emphasis in the way some of the material is presented and some of the things I'm asking them to do. Um, and they'll realise that as they go through it. And for people who are doing it the first time, you've got the benefit of the fact that we have now learned from our mistakes last time. It's going to be better than last time. Um, last time I went into it thinking, if we don't totally fail, crash and burn, it's a success. <laughs> yes. So by that measure, it was a success. We've set ourselves a standard now. It was okay last time. It was, it was actually one of the most successful courses that Coursera had put on at the time. It was the second highest grossing in terms of students that they'd had. Not so it was, it was doing pretty well. Um, that may be the math guy thing that helped there, but it, but it did pretty well. Um, but that set us a bar, and we're now definitely, I mean, I will be disappointed if we don't exceed that bar. An individual can feel so involved and so mm -hmm. personally invested that they would literally contact the instructor oh, yeah, and say, yeah. I'm coming back. Yeah, no, they, they, I mean, and, and in a sense, we set them up for doing that yeah. because one of the things I tried to convey was getting a sense of me as a person. You know, I actually appear on camera, and I didn't have to, I could have done it like Khan Academy, where you never see the person involved. I wanted them to get a sense of me because mathematics is dry, abstract, decontextualized, I think you need a person to make contact up. I mean, and I was their, their friendly grandfather or uncle or whatever it was. Uh, I thought that was really important. Mm -hmm. But if you watch what I'm doing, I'm actually not teaching. I'm not telling them any material. I'm talking about the course. I'm trying to motivate them. I'm the coach, if you like, saying, you know, you can do this, keep at it. And it was making human contact. Mm -hmm. You know, I recorded in, in the studio, into camera, eye contact. But that was all about making contact with a human being. The moment we start talking about mathematics, I drop out and there's just my hand there. Um, so it was all about making that human contact. So not surprisingly, they did feel they responded. They feel they knew me. That yeah. was the trick. Yeah. You know, it's like everybody knows the newsreader on their favourite TV channel. Right. It's a mm -hmm. member of the family because they're in your living room every night at six o'clock. That's powerful. That's and wonderful. I wanted to use that. Yeah, yeah. that's a, that's actually a, a high high compliment. And for I mean, for all of the emails that you got yeah. telling telling you people would come back, the posts we did a survey at the end of the course last time, and I would say there must have been hundreds and hundreds of people in the post survey when the, in the free response instead of giving feedback on the course, they said, "Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't finish. I'll, I'm going to do it better next time." Like I mean, it was it was amazing that I mean, so many people wanted. I think they yeah. felt that personal connection in such a way yeah. that they like they didn't want to let us down by not finishing yeah, the yeah, course. Yeah, that, that that's what education is about. <laughs> the, the teacher, you know, teachers don't really teach. What they do is they inspire mm -hmm. students to learn. I don't think we can. I don't think I can teach anybody anything. The best I can hope is to inspire them to learn because learning is the active thing. Right. I don't know what teaching is in some sense, except inspiration. And so my, I, I see my role as to inspire them. And in a sense, it's an easy one because I love the subject. And I like to inspire people in them, you know. I mean, there's, there's, you have to fake a lot 
in a medium. Right. But what you're not faking is your love of the subject. Yes, or you and wouldn't it, be there. And, and, and that you're going to be there. So I was very gratified that they contacted me because it meant that much had worked. Um, I, you know, the one thing I couldn't do, which I love doing with real students, is when they come into your office, as they do all the time when you talk to them. That's missing. Yeah. Uh, for, for those of us giving them, there's a lot of, of interesting upsides. The big downside is you never get to know the students. Mm -hmm. And you know, we wouldn't be in the business if we didn't like getting to know students. Absolutely. Actually, I've had some professors I'm a little bit suspicious about, but, uh, <laughs> but most of us love this stuff. There's one in every crowd. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah.